Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be in church tonight? Glad to feel the presence of the Lord? Amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I love being in God's house. Amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. I would like for you to join me in Matthew chapter 9. And um, I do not perceive that I will be long tonight. I, I have chosen a short section of Scripture tonight because I want it to get in our hearts and our minds and our spirits. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about a Messiah on a mission, obviously part 16, and I want to talk to you about the theology of feasting. The theology of feasting. Let's read in the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter. This is a long list of things that he took authority over and that he conquered. Things that he lifted himself above, such as the law, such as the prophets, disease, demons, all of these things he elevated himself above these things to prove that he had the authority. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, and we will begin reading in verse number 9. Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your guys don't. Thy disciples fast not. And I can understand their problem there. If I was in a fasting camp and they were feasting over there, I'd be asking the same question. Hey, how come we're on the starvation thing here and they're over there in the chow line? Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, lest the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. I have chosen tonight a short section of scriptures so that I can get my point made tonight. And I want it to lodge in your hearts. And I want you to understand tonight that fasting is important. It is eminently important. It empowers us with the power over spirits. Jesus said when they were troubled by how they could not cast out the devil, he said to them in Matthew 17 and 21, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Fasting is important. Fasting empowers us 
over evil and wicked spirits. It gives us restraining power over either our own impulses or the spirit world. And it gives us the ability to control spirits. By fasting, we have a power over that which is demonic. And the more we yield from ourselves, the more we push away the natural, the more that we push away the earthly, the more power we have in the spirit world. So fasting is talked about at length in Jesus' ministry. And Jesus discusses fasting at length in Matthew chapter 6, and we taught through that. Now, tonight's text deals directly with a theology of feasting. And I'm afraid that many people get fasting and wouldn't go very long without doing so. And I don't... I don't dismiss that. I don't negate that. But I want to take this Bible tonight and challenge you that as intentional as you are in your fasting, you must be that intentional in your feasting. Because there is a theology of feasting. Some are high priests at it. Others need a little help. When you talk about fasting, you can't dismiss it and you can't negate it that Jesus believed the table was a platform for miracles. Look at how many miracles happen around food and around the table in the New Testament. Look at how many messages Jesus preached around the table and around food in the New Testament. And you've got to realize the power it has in outreach and in evangelism. It's an important tool that we have to learn how to intentionally use. You must realize the apostolic power of the table and the feast. And you are called as a friend of the bridegroom to feast intentionally. To turn your table into a pulpit. And I'm, I'm, I'm teaching tonight from one that started several churches. And I started, a, I, I start them in, in, in coffee shops and restaurants and, and building that bridge that tears down that austere and, and, and fearful of, no, I've done the church thing and it didn't work. I'm telling you, don't wait until you get a microphone. Get a fork and build a church. My God, if you can't say amen about that, you're never going to say amen about anything. <laughs> you don't need a pulpit to do ministry. You can use your table. You don't need an address and a rental property in order to start an outreach center. Make your house an outreach center. Turn your table into a pulpit which is going to express the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the world to come. Jesus said that I can do this. Now, Jesus is turning a lot of things on its head right here. And the next thing that I want to talk about is the call of Matthew. Matthew was at the tax custom and receipt at the custom house. So Matthew wasn't just a tax collector. He kind of ran a tax booth. And, and if you get the notes and, and you look down in the footnotes, I gave a, a whole deal about Judean tax law. They hated them. They hated tax collectors. They were publicans, which means they were, they were, in, they were in cahoots with the Roman government and and. Herod Antipas, and they, they would, the way they would do it is they would take a guy and they would say, you're the tax collector and you're, you're in charge of this area. Well, what do you want? We want this many pounds of gold, more or less. And, and they say, well, what do I get to do that? Well, we're not paying you to do that. Just add a little extra to it. 
When you go knock on that door and tell them they owe 10 shekels, just tell them they owe 13, and the 13 will be your, your paycheck. Well, the greed got in their hearts, and greed got in their spirits, and they began to use extortionary practices, and they began to extort people for larger and larger sums of money. And this obviously leaves a welt on people's life because they feel taken advantage of. And not only that, you're conspiring with the Romans against us and you're a traitor and you're, you're, you're on the other side, right? So, so they hated these people. And these people, and, and let me just tell you, Israel at that time was good at hating these people. They were good at hating a lot of people. Ask the Samaritans how that went. If they ever got a grudge against you, it could last for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so these tax collectors, the taxes were collected all on, on just earnings, but produce, goods. And so Matthew was kind of like, he was over a bunch of tax collectors. And he had a tax business. He had a tax booth. And he would sit in the custom house. And if you were bringing in four cows to sell, he'd make you pay taxes going in and make you pay taxes coming out. So the people who he knew hated him and the people he never met in his life hated him. You take someone's money and they'll hate you quickly. And so Jesus comes along and he does something in verse number nine that sent all kinds of, uh, of reverberations through the community. He calls a tax collector, and says unto him, follow me. And he arose and he followed him. Now, in this understanding of the text, Jesus does something that is staggering to the mind of who you think ought to be called to preach, who you think ought to be used, who's qualified, who's disqualified, who's worthy, who's unworthy. Jesus turns all of that over on its ear and says, listen, I'll call who I want to call. And I'll set up and I'll put down and I'll draw in and I will manage my own kingdom. Well, they didn't like that, right? Then you find in verse, I love this, verse number 10 of chapter 9, it came to pass as Jesus sat in the house. Now, all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, place this dinner at Matthew's house immediately after the call of Matthew. Now, most probably there was a gap between when he was called. This wasn't a, a Zacchaeus kind of thing where he said, let's go home right now and eat lunch. It, it, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, by the reception in the crowd, it, it, it is almost saying to me that Jesus said, follow me. And then told Matthew, I'm going to go to your house and get your friends, other outcasts, other tax collectors, other publicans and other sinners. And let's have a conversion party. Because you're converted to me. You're following me. Now let's do evangelism. Where are we going to do evangelism, Jesus? We're going to go do outreach at the temple? No, let's call your friends and let's tell them that you're loved. Let's tell them that you're found. Let's tell them that you got your sight. Let's tell them that you found the master. Let's tell them. And Matthew begins, it dawns on him that, whoa, I'm getting more than what I bargained for. How many of you have heard us say, blur the lines? How many of you have seen these young people run around with a sweatshirt that said, blur the lines? You're like, what in the world does that mean? That means blur the lines between your on church night and your off church night. Quit doing ministry when you get to church. Blur those lines and do it in every house you go to. Do it in every restaurant you get to. Don't let the line be so thick that you say, well, I, it's not my church time. Do ministry in your business. Do ministry in your hobbies. Do ministry in your day-to-day in your -day living. Blur those lines and let people get more than what they bargain for when they meet you. Okay, so Jesus blurs the lines. Jesus says, not only am I going to cross the line and call people you don't like, but then I'm going to go to their house. What is he actually doing? Well, he may be eating with people he shouldn't be eating with because there's a huge theology around eating with people. And the power of the table is not 
to be underestimated by the church. And there is a practical, a spiritual, and an eschatological significance of the table in the New Testament church. Let's study it tonight. Now, first and foremost, Jesus understands that it is important to break down walls of reservation, breaking down walls of reluctance, breaking down walls of hesitancy, breaking down walls of prejudice. And Jesus does this at the table. Read with me Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. They say to him, John didn't come eating or drinking. And you say he had the devil. Then in verse 19, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. That was what they didn't like. They didn't mind what he was eating. They didn't mind that he was feasting. They didn't like the fact that he had turned his table into his pulpit. Now, in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 7, the Lord is laying out the same principle through the gospel writer of Luke. And Luke is explaining that when they saw it, they murmured and said that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. What are you doing eating and drinking with people who aren't good enough? And Jesus said, I'm not fellowshipping, I'm doing ministry. There's a difference because 1 Corinthians teaches us that if someone's gonna live in rebellion and someone is, is the antithesis to godliness, I should not fellowship with them. Even to the point to where I should not break bread with a brother which is actively engaged in fornication, right? Because that fellowship encourages him to keep doing what he's doing, right? And so I'm, I'm not to let my good be evil spoken of. I'm not to empower that which is ungodly. But yet Jesus said, I'm not doing it for fellowship. I'm doing ministry. I'm leading them out. And I'm using the table to do so. And so Proverbs chapter 13, just so you know that the Bible speaks of this and that I'm not just openly saying, turn life into a party. I'm not, I'm saying turn it into a to, into an outreach and evangelism session. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 20 says that he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Chapter 14 and verse number seven of Proverbs, go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not him the lips of knowledge. And so they're telling you it is imprudent, it is unwise for you to make your association fools or imprudent people or mouthy people that are just railing. But that's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus was open to people who were lost, hungry, desperate, wanting, just don't know a way out, just never had a hand up, just never got an offer, just never got the potential, the opportunity. And so Jesus says, come and dine. The master's calling and it comes as a great shock to them. Now, the Jewish tradition is a warning against improper, excessively intimate association with wicked people, especially at mealtimes. Because if you're just doing it to just Re relax and hang out with them. I did that one time, hanging out. I was like 14. I thought, God, if you'll get me out of this, I will never do this again. What are we doing? We're hanging out. Okay, let's get this over with. We're just staring at one another, giggling over nothing. Let's go do something with our life, right? So I'm not just there to hang out with sinners. I'm not there to just, you know, kick around with them. I, I want them to get more than what they bargained for when they get a fishing trip with me. When they get a dinner with me, I want them to say, whoa, I didn't show up here to buy that. I, you know, you guys get the blur of the lines thing. How many of you have been to Canadian Tire? Raise your hand. Yeah, you know exactly what I'm saying, blur the lines. Is there even tires in that place? <laughs> you talk about a, a business model that has blurred the lines. Show up at Canadian Tire left with a blender, forks, knives, and a nose hair trimmer. Like what in the world? At a tire shop. 
I mean, these people have completely blurred the lines. They got me buying stuff. I'm like, I didn't even want this. I wanted tires. I got a lounge chair. I got a sun umbrella, and it's 20 below zero and three feet of snow. I'm like, these people have blurred the lines awfully good. That's the way the church has got to be. Sure, I'll visit your church, and the next thing you know, they're walking out with righteousness, godliness, a whole new lifestyle, the oneness of the Godhead, soteriology, eschatology. And they're saying, I didn't come to buy this. I just wanted tires. We blur the lines here. Why? Because that's a successful business model, apparently. They have, a, they have superstores now that are huge. More tires. See if you can find them in the blenders and microwaves and awnings and umbrellas and beach towels, snow shovels. This is, that's Jesus. Master, I'm here for water. Okay, I'll give you water that if you ever drink, you'll never thirst again. I didn't actually come for a whole eternal lesson. I just came because I was thirsty. No, no, when you walk to Jesus' table, he is up to something because that bread has theology in it. That bread is about God. That bread is about you. That bread is about eternity. That bread has eschatological. It has eternal implications in it. And that's the way we have to live. Now, let's look at Luke chapter 14, verse number 12. Luke chapter 14 and verse number 12. This is again Jesus using the table to do spiritual things. Verse, verse number, he, he's telling them and teaching them. He's laying it out to them that, that if you will follow me, if you will walk with me. He says to them in verse 12, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, don't call your buddies, don't call your clique, and don't call your family. Don't call your brethren, your kinsmen, and please don't do the you scratch my back, I'll scratch your thing by trying to get elite dinner guests. Don't call the rich, he says. Don't go get your rich neighbors and say, if I bring them over here to eat, maybe they'll have me, and, you know, we'll be eating together. He said, don't do that. Because they're going to bid you again, and they're going to recompense but when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, that thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper, bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said, I got ground. The other one said, I, I got to go see it. Another one says, I bought five yoke and oxen. Another said that I've married a wife and therefore I cannot or I can and I'll just be really late. See, I felt that. That was powerful. <laughs> the Lord said to the master of the house, do not be angry, go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city, bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done that thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in, and my house may be filled. And I say unto you, none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Do you see how spiritual supper is with Jesus? He's likening the invitational aspect of the kingdom of God to him inviting them to supper. Supper is something that Jesus takes serious. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 20. This is what your Bible says. Likewise also the cup after supper. Saying this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Whoa, that just took a shift. We went from bread to a tax collector. We went from having a block party for new converts to witness to their neighbors. We went from Jesus likening supper to the entrance into the kingdom 
And now he's got a cup in his hand and bread in his hand. And he's saying, this is blood and this is bread. And you kind of get that spiritual Canadian tire thing thinking, did I really come for all this? I'm going to tell you something. Jesus blurs the lines. Jesus is going to pack you down. Jesus is going to load you up. Jesus is going to fill you with the power of the world to come. Isn't that what Hebrews 6 says? And we have tasted of the good word of God. Didn't Luke chapter 1, Jesus say, oh, taste and see. Didn't, didn't the understanding come that this was an aspect of, of dining with God and that supper becomes fellowship and now fellowship has become. See how outreach gets to evangelism and see how evangelism gets to communion and see how communion gets to marriage uh, and how marriage gets to the eternal city. All of a sudden you've got this escalation that God is saying, just keep eating with me and you're going to get a little more every time you show up to eat with me. And then people are like, well, I invited that person over and we had lasagna and I never, I never heard anything back from him. Don't stop. Don't stop inviting them. Don't stop doing outreach. Don't stop finding excuses to have coffee with them. Don't stop reaching out to them. Don't, don't, don't just shake the dust off your feet so quickly. But you have an obligation to escalate the precept and the principle until they're standing there saying, wait a minute. I thought I was just here for a bid on a job. And the next thing I know, I'm being introduced to a whole new life. That's the power of what Jesus wants us to do through the theology of feasting. This isn't a party. This is an evangelism effort. This isn't a party. This is an outreach program that Jesus said, your table is your pulpit. Who are you using it for? You think God gave you all that food just for you and her? You think God gave you that big old house just for him and you? God gave you what he has and blessed you so that you can open the doors of your home and bid them come. Come to what? The theology of the table. That God is going to give a feast and he is going to alter your entire world. That's the theology of the table. And it goes from there and it elevates into communion. 1 Corinthians, turn there with me please. 1 Corinthians Chapter 11. Let's look there together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus that same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance for me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup and do shew the Lord's death, remember, honor, respect, and regard the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body. And of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Eateth and drinketh damnation to his self. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. And many sleep. Now he's not saying that if you take communion poorly. You're going to get sick and die. That's not necessarily what that text means. What it means is you already are sick and you already are dying. And you will die spiritually as well as you are dying naturally unless you discern there is something different about what I'm doing right now. Unless you have faith to believe uh, that his blood shed for you shall forgive you. What Jesus is saying in this is when he lifts that cup in Luke, uh, he says, this is my blood. Was it really his blood? No. It is a type of his blood. We don't believe in transubstantiation as the Catholic Church does. We don't believe in the Eucharist as it physically turns into blood and flesh. We don't believe that. 
because it is a remembrance of God. It is my faith that says, uh, when I take this cup, uh, I will not die and I will live forever. Do you understand that eternality is not something that's going to come one day when you get rewarded? You're in eternity now. And everything that you are is bracketed with a temporary disruption in the eternal health or eternal damnation of your life. If you're saved and you perceive there is healing, I'm telling you, listen to me tonight. Jesus prophesied this long time ago. Before there was a foundation of the world, the lamb was shed and the blood ran from that lamb. That's why John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And that's why when they saw him in the book of Revelations, his blood was shed from the foundation of the world. Why? Because all of this sin that's imported, what is our problem? Our problem is we're dying. Why? Why are we dying? Because somebody had a table that didn't have any faith and didn't have any obedience. And when Adam and Eve partook of what God never wanted them to partake of, death and sin entered. But when we partake of the heavenly and of the body of Jesus Christ, we live forever in Christ. See, this thing is huge, church. This theology of the table is massive. You need communion. You need it because it heals you. Not because the cup heals you, but the faith that God, he was wounded for my transgressions. Uh, he was bruised for my iniquities. Uh, the chastisement of my peace is upon him. And by his stripes, uh, I am holy, complete, made whole. Is that because I take this cup and what's in this cup heals me? No, it's the faith in what he did. This is not superstition. This is not mysticism. This is not spiritualism. This is the power of the table that the Lord hath prepared. Oh, we ought to want communion. We ought to desire it. And the people got scared of it because, yes, there's judgment because he's an awesome, mighty God. And people got scared and said, I take that, you know, drink damnation. And Paul had to correct this and say, listen to me, church. This cup is a cup of blessing. This is not a cup of curse. The cup of curse is what you've been drinking your whole life. But when you come to the banquet... This whole thing's designed to be a feast. God gave them a table in the wilderness with bread and manna from heaven. God provided the prophets, uh, the ravens fed them. Uh, you've got to understand that God will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Don't get obsessed by who, what, where, and when. Just believe that God is going to feed you when you need to be fed. You understand that ravens are a filthy animal, a carrion bird. They dig and pick and, and devour roadkill and nasty stuff and eat rotting carcass and whatever they can. And they're, they're biblically and scripturally unclean, right? They're unclean. The Bible calls them unclean. But isn't it amazing that when the prophet needed food, the ravens fed him? I've seen God use a lot of dirty birds to feed prophets. I've seen God bring miracles and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. I'm a little weirded out by this. And all the while, God's preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And so, man, the supper comes alive. And he says to them, he said, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. What am I doing when I take the supper? I'm judging myself saying, God, I want your table. I may not be everything I should be. I know I'm not. My wife knows I'm not. But I'm telling you before God, I want the blessing of that cup. Will you make up the difference? And the theology of the table says, if you will feast with me, I will make up the difference. Go read everywhere in your Bible. Every great thing that happened in the Bible, there was a pivot point around food, around the table. Go read about Ruth and Boaz. 
while he sat there and reached her parched corn. And she got down and said, how can you be this good to a dead dog like me? I'm going to tell you what that was. That was a picture of Jesus reaching us Gentiles, the blessings of grace, saying, come to my table. Read about David where the Lord provided for him at the table of shewbread. Read about the prophets that God provided over and over and over. There's a sanctified effort at the table. Who have you sanctified by your house? When's the last time your house sanctified somebody? When's the last time grace was introduced at your table? When's the last time the power of the risen Christ was exposed and was articulated around your table? See, it's more than just our crock pots and pressure cookers. All the blessing of God is so that I can brag on Him. Jesus says, I'm what you're looking for. I'm the bread. Judge yourself of this. Realize and, and hold yourself accountable for what you do in feasting. I dare say if any of you, and if I took a poll or a monkey survey, many of you would say, well, I don't believe I can be saved without prayer and fasting. But I would to God that you'd add a little feasting in there. I would to God that you could understand this revelation uh, that when you want something out of your life, go ahead and fast. Uh, if you want a dirty spirit fa out, fast. Uh, if you want a demon out, fast. Uh, but when you want somebody in the church, feast with them. Uh, if you want things coming to you, you got to open your table because fasting pushes unclean out uh, and feasting brings something in. If I wanted a devil out, I'd fast until I had the power over such unclean spirits. If I wanted the hold of some wicked and vile thing that had gripped my mind or life, I'd fast until that was broken. But when I want a friend, I feast with them. When I want a brother, I feast with them. When I want a spouse, I feast with her. See, you got to eat with Jesus. If you want him to be the husband and the bridegroom, if you want the church to unify and marry up to Christ, you've got to learn how to come into the table of the Lord and say, this is more than just me coming to church. This is me breaking the bread of life. We get so spiritual about fasting and then we have years go by that we haven't had a feast in our home. And God is disappointed. Because it's not Christian. It may be, may be Pentecostal, but it's not Christian. Because Christ opened the table constantly to people that are saying, who is that? And why are they here? And what are they doing? Not only that, but Matthew chapter 8, he ups it a little bit more. He will not leave theology alone. Matthew chapter 8, I, we just taught on this a week ago. In verse 10 and verse 11, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and he said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, where in the world is this? What is in the world is this talking about? Well, you got to get in the book of Revelations where the two suppers are. See, there's two suppers. There's only one that I want to go to, but there's two suppers. Amen. There's a supper that starts in Revelations chapter 19 and verse number 9. He saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He ain't even going to unify himself with the church without having a table involved. So there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then in verse number 18 and 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves unto the supper of the great God. This is a supper of authority. This is a supper of prophetic utterance that is living, fulfilled in him at that present time. 
And if God is inviting you, I'm telling you, do everything in your power to make it to that first supper, which is the supper of the Lamb, which is the marriage, which is the union, which is the love. You read the book of Song of Solomon. She walks in that palace and the Bible says that she looks at a banquet table. That little girl never seen anything like that in all of her life. She was an outcast. People didn't like her. Nobody wanted to be around her. She walked in that place and there was a massive table spread. And she asked somebody stand there. She said, "Why? what is the festival? What, what are we doing here? And there was a banner. Go read this. It's in Song of Solomon. And the banner over the table was one word, love. I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because I care. I'm doing this because you are the apple of my eye. I'm doing this because I don't want you to be judged. Why would God do all this? One word, love. He's doing this so that you can see this. Jesus wants you to understand that the reason they weren't fasting is because we're not fasting because we're busy feasting. And John says, fast guys, fast. Why? Because something's got to go. Jesus said, well, I'm not fasting because something doesn't need to go. Well, what, what's going on then? Something needs to come. Something needs to appear. Well, what? Well, I taught you, he said, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. See, a fasting would, would imply that we're trying to get rid of some aspect. He said, John already did that. John's the last. See, the New Testament doesn't start in Matthew 1 and 1. John is the last New Testament prophet. John is the last one that's prophesying of the coming king, John is the last one in the prophetic age. He's, he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. And so he got his disciples and he said, guys, if you're going to follow me, you got to fast. Why we got to fast? Because there's something we got to get rid of. What was it? We got to challenge our presuppositions. We have to challenge the chokehold of the law that's on Israel. We got to get rid of what isn't working. Jesus shows up and said, let's eat, boys. Uh, the kingdom is coming. Uh, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, the kingdom's right here. You can, for the kingdom of God is within you. All of a sudden, the kingdom's breaking in. The kingdom's getting on the inside. And Jesus said, let's eat. It'll draw in the kingdom. Let's eat. It'll pull in the next phase. Matthew's so careful not to use the word new very often. Go look it up in your Bible. Very rarely. Do the gospel writers use the word in the Greek for new? But Jesus uses it here. Jesus plainly lays it out in your Bible in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 16. No man putteth a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. See, what John was fasting for was the old garment to be taken away. Oh, one day I preach to you and I baptize you with water. But there's coming one after me who's mightier than I. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Something new is coming. Something earth shattering. Uh, something that's going to break in uh, on old paradigms. What is it? It's the kingdom of God. And Jesus got here and pre prepared a table and said, everybody ought to come. Come on, come and dine. The master's calling. And he said, who, me? Yes, and Jesus said this, No man putteth new cloth on an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it. If you've got a garment that's threadbare, you don't just patch it because the rest of the thing is going to fall apart. And what Jesus was telling you here is that the old covenant had come to its stretching capacity. It could not go beyond what it was. It had stretched to its ultimate limits. It had done everything it could. It can't save you anymore. The blood of bulls and goats. Go read the book of Hebrews. It, it explains all this. The blood and bulls of goats. If that would have been working, we'd still be under that covenant and still be doing that. But it doesn't work. But there remaineth now a better sacrifice. <laughs> hey Amen. There's a priesthood in the Old Testament, Levites. But they're like an old wineskin. See, they would take them stomachs of them wineskins. And they would fill them up with new wine. And while that thing was fermenting, 
it was starting to stretch and starting to grow. And as that thing would grow, it would stretch that leather all the way out. It would soak it through and it was supple and it was huge and stretching. And then they would pour it out and get rid of the dregs and they'd pour out the, the, the new wine. And, and they'd take these old things and they would dry up. And, and people that were on a budget, people that were cheap and people that were poor would go find these things and say, well, it's not in that bad a condition. I'll put new wine in it and, you know, get something ready for Passover. And they'd put it in there and that wine would start fermenting and fomenting and tumult and the yeast would rise in it and start expanding and the cracks would all of a sudden it'd rip and burst in their harvest would be running down the dirt. Jesus said, new stuff's coming. Eat with me. Feast with me. The theology of the table's pressing in. We're getting rid of the old covenant, boys. Why? Because we're going to, something's going to happen. What's going to happen? The death of the testator. The one who wrote the Old Testament has to die. And there he dies and there he finishes and God raises a church out of the newness of a new priest. Whoever liveth to make intercession. Whoever liveth to provide for you what you need. Jesus said don't stuff the new covenant in old tradition. Don't put the new covenant. It's, it's signaling. And they're standing there going don't get it. Don't know why. Why is your guys getting to eat? Because my guys are bringing something new in. Well, it's not fair. How come John's guys fasted? They were getting rid of that old wine skin. Because Jesus had a whole new vessel. Well, where's the vessel? He said to you in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, When we sat down in my kingdom, they're going to come from every nation, kindred and tongue. And they're going to sit down. And the ones who think they deserve it, that's not who's going to get it. Because they're going to get outer darkness. And they're going to get hell and gnashing of teeth. Because when I invited them, they wouldn't come. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost tonight. There is a theology in feasting. And that doesn't mean you don't fast and you don't pray. But what that means is when the old goes out, you better have a supper ready to invite the new in. And that's what Jesus was doing when he was feeding free bread and turning water into wine. What's that got to do with any of this? He's letting you know the kingdom is about bringing something new, something lively, something fresh, something holy. It doesn't mean that the old was bad. It just means it's stretched to its limits. It's taken you as far as it can take you. Well, how will we know the new will come Isaiah said, well, I'll tell you a little secret if you're looking for the new. He's going to eat with you. And he's going to give you bread that you're not going to need to buy. And when you take of that bread, you're going to live forever. And when you read Malachi, there's coming a prophet. He said, who shall give a supper? And Jesus sat with them and ate with them. Broke bread and you realize very quick. That the second man, Adam, was right where the first man, Adam, was wrong. And you realize real quick that while the first man, Boaz, gave that Ruth a lineage, this Boaz gave this Ruth an inheritance. And while that table brought you as far as a Davidic covenant, this one is the son of God, not just the son of David. And you realize that it keeps getting sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. And you ask, what can we really do to show the world what it is to be holy? I say, open your tables. And I say, brag about what Jesus did for you. And brag about how good God is in your life. And tell your testimonies and witness. And tell of the miracles that God has done for you. Tell of your pillar of cloud. Tell of your manna that fell. Tell of your suppers of grace and your banquets of love. Tell where your foot had well nigh slipped, but he brought you back in. Brag on the goodness of God. They say, well, what, what can I do, pastor, to be a part of this Revival and a part of these new ones come in. Have you a table? 
Have you bread? Have you a God? Put them together and use them for the glory of the coming kingdom. Amen. Let's stand today. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I pray tonight that we are those who represent the bridegroom. Jesus, you've asked us to pray and you asked us to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I'm asking you to let your kingdom come. Not just the church, not just the ministry, not just the rapturing of the church, but let your kingdom come to my house. Let your kingdom come to my table and where I sit, oh God. Let your kingdom come to the coffee shop where I'm doing homework and studying. Uh, let your table come to the hole uh, where I'm standing fishing, God. Uh, let your table break in. Uh, give me this day my daily bread. Uh, oh Jesus, I want to eat of your heavenly kingdom. I want to partake of your goodness, your will, your grace, uh, and your power. Give this church a revelation uh, on the theology of the table. Let us feast with heaven. Let us feast and celebrate with your banquet of love. Let us take communion with joy in our hearts, peace in our minds, and faith in our spirits. Let us take the blood of Jesus in faith and be healed of the death and sickness that is already working inside of us. Jesus, I ask you to give this church a greater appetite for the word of God. God, I pray that you give us an appetite for your word. Let Wednesday nights be as full as Sunday mornings in this church. Give us a hunger for revelation, a hunger and an appetite for the word of God. Help us not to become just those that do not understand what you're doing, but let us sit at heaven's table. Let us partake and eat of your goodness and glory, and we will give you great praise in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight. Go in the joy of the Lord and the strength of his word. Try your best to find somewhere in the next week before we get back next Wednesday night to study the word of God. Try to turn your table into a pulpit. God bless you tonight. Go in the strength of the word of the Lord.